Thanks very much indeed for joining us. It's really a pleasure. appreciate it. Thanks. For Talk us through a little bit of uh, the, your current research and what are some of the challenges that you're most looking forward to tackling? One of the questions uh, that I've been thinking about for a long time is the origin of cosmic magnetic fields. We know that uh, planets have magnetic fields. We know that stars have magnetic fields. We know that galaxies have magnetic fields. Galax you can find magnetic fields anywhere where you look in the, in the universe. And the obvious question is, um, where are they from? Did they originate before the time when the universe became transparent or uh, afterwards? How does it happen uh, in the stars? How does it happen in planets? The theorists have, have developed the, uh, ideas about how this might happen. Probably the, the first key paper uh, was by a colleague of mine who has since passed away, Eugene Parker, who had the first concrete suggestion of how, for example, the sun might generate its magnetic field. Now, since then, uh, there have been three different questions that have come up. One of them is, where do the seed magnetic fields come from? The very, the starting bits. And uh, there is an answer to that that theorists have. It's called the uh, Beerman battery mechanism. We know that we're surrounded by turbulent fluids, turbulent conducting fluids, fluids let's call them plasmas. You stick a magnetic field in, what happens? And theorists have developed the idea that turbulence in a conducting fluid can actually amplify these seed, seed magnetic fields. And then finally is the question of how these large scale fields that, for example, the sun uh, um, has, and the uh, paper by Gene Parker that I mentioned before uh, was the first one that actually came to basically explain that. That's this all theory. Right. What about experiment? So it turns out one of the remarkable things over the last decade or so is that it's been possible to do experiments that valid, validate the idea of the Biermann battery mechanism to generate seed fields. And uh, one, uh, it's been possible to do experiments that then demonstrate that turbulent plasmas, in fact, amplify, exponentially amplify these seed fields. And these experiments have been done on some brand new um, uh, uh, experimental facilities. The uh, National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore, for example. Uh, the uh, Laser Energetic Laboratory uh, um, at uh, Rochester. Right. So we have a pretty good understanding of what happens to the, the seeds, how they get amplified. The question is, what about this order? And it turns out that Gene Parker's idea wasn't the only one. It's not the only one of doing it. And so there's a bit of controversy of which way it's done. And in order to decide, there's nothing like experiment. Right. And the crucial question is, will we figure out how to do an experiment? So, so my, where my thinking go, is going is thinking about how one might construct an experiment to validate this idea, how order can come out of chaos like it does in the sun, like it does in the planets, like it does in the galaxy. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because, because you're talking about new facilities that enable you to be able to conduct experiments Absolutely. that you might not have been able to right. do before. And that must be very exciting for a, a physicist. It's hugely exciting. And also what's particularly interesting is it's hugely accidental. Because the facilities I, just, I was just talking about were not uh, built, they were not paid for idea of entertaining people like Bob Rosner to do his, his, his science. They were actually conducted for a totally different purpose. They were uh, uh, constructed uh, for uh, the uh, nuclear stockpile stewardship program by the Department of Energy. So it turns out those facilities have a, what is sometimes called an open science program, so where you can do unclassified experiments. And my colleagues, for example, at the University of Chicago, in collaboration with folks at Oxford, for example, at Rochester, uh, were able to do the experiments that I talked about before. I know one of the other areas that you're very much engaged with is energy, isn't right. it? Uh, talk, us through, talk us through that. So I became uh, interested in uh, energy matters when I was uh, at Argonne. I was um, the chief scientist and, and director there, and I spent a, a fair amount of time in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and what I discovered and when it comes to technical matters, including energy, um, there are sensible things said, but also a lot of things said that are, I would say, are, let's call it hot air. So 
I got interested in this question of whether or not we can do more as scientists to become part of the conversation. So at the University of Chicago, it led me to, uh, with a partner, an economist named Bob Dupel, to create an energy policy institute uh, called EPIC, which had, had this unique uh, feature of a physicist and an economist actually spending time together perhaps arguing some of the time, but at least enjoying each other's conversation and helping each other understand what's going on. One of the things that I realized is that there are, that if you think about the energy transition that we're, we're in right now, uh, there is a technical roadmap, which is like all technical roadmaps, I think we're, we physicists, our colleagues in chemistry and engineering, we know how to do this. But then there's all, also a public policy roadmap. Right. And that, in my, uh, my view, is where the problem is. In order to accomplish what we want to do on the technical side, uh, we need to have a clear understanding of what needs to be on the policy side. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, in order to deal with the new generation capabilities of renewables, wind and solar, which are becoming increasingly dominant, we, we know we have to restructure our electric grid. Well, in the United States, that's a difficult thing to do because the, uh, the agency, federal agency that's responsible for the grid, FERC, is unfortunately uh, not empowered to really do this easily. And so there's a roadblock here that's legislative in nature and what it, one of the consequences is you get into these partisan arguments right. that basically just de de delay the whole business. And so, okay, we may be generating lots of electricity in, by renewables, but we don't have a very good way of now dispatching it in an efficient way. So what I see is we have to figure out a way, perhaps scientists can help in turning the conversation on the policy side away from partisan matters and, had, and doing what we've done in other areas. Uh, for example, in, in, in space matters, I think both, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, were together in their vision of what should happen in space. And so NASA has always been a fairly apolitical kind of agency. Uh, during the Eisenhower administration, when we built out our uh, national network of highways, again, that was pretty much a nonpartisan issue. Right. And we need to find that also in the uh, energy field, and we're not there yet. An outsider might say, perhaps not hugely constructively, that uh, the stakes are very high. Yes, they I are. I mean, one could argue that the future of our planet is, is, is at stake here. The stakes are very high. And the consensus that you're hoping for seems further away than ever. Right. Yes, it's true. It's driven by many factors, some economic. Uh, there's no question that it's expensive to change large systems. So people with uh, vested interests um, are challenging to move. Uh, we see this, for example, in, uh, in getting rid of coal. We have a state, West Virginia, where the coal industry is a mainstay of the economy, and we have to figure out a way of helping them survive this transition. I see this really as a trying to find a way of a win-win, where, for example, the folks in West Virginia can understand that they will be helped through this transition, that we're not just throwing them to the wolves, and so those, those kinds of things happen. So how does public policy evolve? I know you're very interested in public policy, so how does public policy evolve to tackle you know, these, these thorny issues? Very, very slowly. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, I think, you know, as physicists, we're sort of used to, you know, we've made a decision, this is what I'm gonna do, let's do it. That's not quite how it works. And uh, so what we're running into here is, of course, uh, a problem that science has more and more today, which is the skepticism that many in the public have towards science. Just because I or my colleagues say this should be done doesn't mean that people will applaud and say, yay, verily, we shall do this. Part of the problem is our language. When I talk about a topic with my, with my colleagues, I use certain words, vocabulary, that I think can easily be misunderstood by others who are not steeped in science culture. So for example, when I say, I think uh, I'm uncertain about this. I, I recall telling this to one of my uncles and I, talking about some energy problem. And I said, well, we're not quite certain about this. 
his response was, oh, you mean you don't know what you're talking about? I said, no, 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 no. So we have to explain what, when we say we're uncertain, we have to explain what that means. That's the point number one. And point number two is, uh, as scientists, we're used to changing our mind when we get more evidence. That can be also misunderstood, misunderstood because it could be said that, well, your previous opinion, you were just lying to us, you're just making it up. And I think the idea that we respond to changes in evidence is something that is not a trivial matter to explain and has to be done the right way. And, and that, that has to do now with language. That I don't think anybody, scientists or not, likes to be talked down to. You make a really interesting, you make a lot of really interesting points, but you, but you talk there about uh, the way that scientists might work, about reaching a consensus and then and taking something forward. But you also talk about the, the, the sort of trust deficit that, right. that, 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 that there is. And one almost feels like that, that the scientists may be working a different way to those people who don't believe or have that trust in them. So what do scientists, what not need to do, what can scientists do to, 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 to help in this area? I think the APS uh, has programs in this regard. Um, uh, the theme really is trust science and the question of how do you do that? And I think the way that's done uh, is basically to have, you know, we're part of a social milieu. We have neighbors. Right. All of us have neighbors. And there's nothing wrong with us talking to our neighbors about how we feel about uh, uh, issues that touch on science, where science matters. And these conversations are not conversations where I'm lecturing somebody, because that's the last thing that needs to be done, where we just talk about something, where we listen to the concerns of the people that are our neighbors, and we respond to them in a way that isn't a matter of just us lecturing them, but basically trying to explain. I guess my final question is something you've touched on before, which is the future of your, uh, of, of your profession. And uh, how kind of encouraged are you by young people coming, coming through? And what do we need to do to, uh, to help? There are two answers to that. So, so the first one uh, has to do with the question of, uh, you know, what's, what about physics itself as a discipline? My sense is that we're really on the threshold of an entirely new era of physical sciences. Um, in part, that's driven by the fact that we have new ways of looking at data. I think the, the, uh, the advances that have been made by our ability to gather enormous amounts of data, to process it, to store it, and to process it, to use some people will call it AI, but I would prefer to call it machine learning capabilities to uh, search for regularities, to improve our ability to optimize, to do things like, for example, invent new ways of synthesizing materials that are purpose designed. All these kinds of things, we're right on the threshold of this major transition. And it couldn't come at a better time because we're also in this transition in our energy world. And so many of the kinds of things that need to be done, for example, new materials, new processes, um, uh, figuring out, for example, how to build buildings by, uh, that involve methods that don't uh, emit so much carbon into the atmosphere. All these things all go hand in hand. And so I think, we, first of all, there's a lot to do, a lot of new things to do. And what's particularly interesting, this is really, um, basic research that's driven by needs and so sometimes you know sometimes our students uh, I've had students who've come to me and in a sense exhibit, exhibit some regrets that they're doing some science and the science is ignoring the rest of the world and actually physics is moving in a direction where it's not like that where what we do matters for the rest of the world so it's, it's inspiring. So what, what I'm saying is that actually for to be young at this point in time is just a great time to get into this field. And I think it's pretty clear that we're limiting ourselves to the extent that we don't invite everybody who can do this into the fold. And so I'm a huge proponent of going after folks who traditionally might not be thinking about physics, uh, people that are definitely underrepresented in our discipline, all, that, all that's required is to have the enthusiasm and the smarts 
and you can become a physicist and have a great time. I've certainly had a great time being a physicist. Why can't others? They should.